Thanks again. I'm Mike Rosenbaum. Um, I'm the CEO of PEG Software. And um, I'm here to talk about applying a bunch of the techniques you've been hearing about today to the issue of talent and talent acquisition and hiring and assembling teams. Um, as probably won't be a surprise to, to everyone here, is that uh, hiring is very subjective, incredibly subjective. And it's based on all kinds of perceptions and subconscious biases. And um, I first got involved in this um, initially as an academic. I was a fellow um, teaching and doing research and writing on economics and law at Harvard um, and was doing a little bit of work for the Clinton White House in the 90s, in the late 90s, originally around tech policy and then around labor issues. And the Clinton White House was building a series of policies that were based on the idea that working class communities were untapped retail and distribution markets. And um, that may be true, um, but my argument was, you know, they may be untapped retail and distribution markets, but more significantly, working class communities are untapped labor markets. And they're untapped labor markets because the labor market is fundamentally built on a resume. And resumes correlate very significantly with socioeconomic background, except that the signals in a resume we interpret in a variety of ways that may or may not be accurate. So whether or not someone goes to college, what college someone goes to, what experience someone has had, may, you know, we interpret in all of, all of the sort of personal prisms we have, but may not actually be telling us you know, what we think it's telling us. And so my argument was if you could apply a large, if you could apply large amounts of data to that problem, you could do a better job of matching high performing people with the most productive places in the workforce. The response was, these other ideas are built on a much more famous person than you, we're going with him. I went back to my ivory tower and uh, my title was fellow and my academic mentor, whose job it was to help me get the job as an assistant professor, said you seem a lot more interested in doing this than you do in writing about it. In academia we write about it, so if you like, perhaps you can go do it, and we'll give you a little bit of money to do it, which was very key. So, um, so we started uh, developing this in 2001, um, which I know was very early. It was before the book Moneyball came out, um, but it now sort of sits within what's you know kind of a new and burgeoning industry of applying some of these concepts to the concept of talent, talent acquisition. Obviously, the industry itself owes a lot to. Um, to Fair Isaacs, you know, I noticed there are some people from FICO here, um, and some of the approaches that Fair Isaacs had taken to suck subjectivity out of the system of credit decisioning. Um, you know, obviously the old way that people used to do it was you'd go and you'd see your local loan officer, and the local loan officer would, you know, would make a decision based on whether or not they liked you and thought they trusted you. Um, and Fair Isaacs sort of pioneered some of the ideas of applying data to this, and then some of the high-speed trading industry similarly later applied, you know really pioneered some ideas around this, um, and then the Oakland A's pioneered some ideas around this. And so um, obviously everyone here I'm sure is familiar with the, the book and movie Moneyball. Um, you know, the book Moneyball coming out was, was very significant for us, but not as significant as the movie Moneyball coming out. But as I think everyone knows, um, you know, the, what the Oakland A's were doing was, was applying data to the idea of hiring baseball players. And so we're doing the same thing, and this industry is doing the same thing, you know, and today there's sort of a bunch of different approaches towards, towards this industry, um, towards this particular problem that I'm gonna talk about today. And, um, and the thing that I'm gonna really focus on the most is outcomes. And, um, you know, for those of you who remember the movie and book Moneyball, you know, one of the most significant things was figuring out what it was you wanted to predict for. And that's part of what the Oakland, A that was part of the big insight of the Oakland A's. Um, you know, similarly in this industry generally, the key is figuring out outcomes. That's significant, obviously, A, to figure out if you want to do it in the first place, you know, whether or not you can actually generate the outcomes you want. B, in terms of the methodologies you approach, you used in order to attack the problem. And uh, C, in terms of adoption, which I'll, I'll talk about sort of as the, the third bucket of this, um, because as you might imagine, adoption um, in an industry that is so accustomed to bias and perception and subjectivity is significant, is a significant challenge. Um, so there are a few different approaches people are taking towards it. There are platforms out there that you know, are deployed essentially into an HR department and apply data to applicant flow into, um, into an enterprise. The, Peg Software that I'm with is, is one of those. Evolve on Demand is another prominent one. Um, you know, Pegged is focused on healthcare and, and 
uh, lesser extent software engineering, Evolve is really focused on call centers and a couple of other industries, but, you know, but those are sort of platforms that are deployed into an enterprise. Um, there's internal use. So, um, so Google, the head of HR, Google Azlebach, has talked a lot about ways in which they apply, um, apply different data techniques to figure out who they should be hiring. Um, Catalyst IT services, the services businesses that actually uses Pegged, um, is, a, is a software engineering business um, that is smaller, only has about 250 employees, but, but uses a platform you know, where it applies data to all of its technologist hires. And then there's some generalized talent prediction platforms. Um, Guild is one, Code Academy is one. There are a bunch of them out there. Um, that look at, um, at data that today you could look at, 10 years ago you couldn't look at, um, in order to make generalized predictions about whether or not someone's gonna be good in a particular type of job. So Guild and Code Academy are really designed to, to figure out if someone is going to be a good software engineer as opposed to a good software engineer in X place. So um, today, um, the sessions I've sat in, have, a lot of them have, have been about, um, about methodologies and the technologies you can use. Um, you know, as is not a surprise, there are a lot of, you know, all of these tech, all of these techniques really are used in this industry. So there's sophisticated analysis of of conventional application data. So the resume itself, does having a college degree predict whether or not you're going to be good in X job? Other application information. So if you're applying for a software engineering job, there are ways in which you can analyze actual code to figure out if it's actually predicting an outcome. Um, text, so, um, so for PEGD, it deploys into healthcare. Um, you know, it has clients that, um, that will have people write a little essay when they're applying for a job. There are ways of analyzing that text, and again, all the ways that won't be surprised to anyone in this room, um, to figure out what's actually correlating with performance and what isn't. There's also public data. Um, the biggest area that folks initially jump to when they think about public data is social networking data. Um, the process of hiring people is a highly regulated area, um, and so there are a bunch of states, by a bunch I mean depending on how you define it, somewhere between 14 and 16, that have passed laws that essentially limit your ability to get access to social networking data when, you, um, when you're making a decision about whether or not someone can, can have a job. Um, you know, I know that at PEG we've made a decision not actually to deploy um, uh, data collection techniques that collect private social networking data um, when making job decisions, you know, as I'm sure is not surprising to anyone, you know, if you apply um, for something or you use Facebook to log into something and you give some consents, you can get a lot of information on someone. Um, we thought that, that some of the collecting data on every single message that someone sends to a friend on Facebook um, and all the things that that can tell you about someone may not actually be the appropriate uh, an appropriate area to really look at when predicting whether or not someone's gonna be good in a job. But you can collect public data and there's a lot of public data out there and then metadata. A few folks have talked about the use of metadata, by which I mean things like keystrokes when someone's applying for a job, um, whether how long someone looks at something. When you can promote, you can prompt particular reactions. So you can uh, you can uh, ask someone a question that doesn't have an answer, or you can cause stress or uncertainty or anxiety, and you can measure their keystroke keystrokes in response to that, and that tells you things about who that person is that aren't necessarily as conscious as answering a, an SAT question. And, um, and so those are important data sets that you can use, um, but the key really comes back to this question of outcome. So what are you optimizing for? Um, you know, the title of this is reducing turnover, and I'll talk about that in a second, but, but there are a lot of things you could be optimizing for. And, you know, and as I think we all know, there are massive data sets that are made possible by the fact that everyone interacts with the internet and everyone interacts with technology and there are all these sensors out there um, that create, again, massive data sets but the question is, what are you doing with it and what are you comparing it to? And when you talk about whether or not someone's good in a job, um, you know, it can be a complicated thing to quantify whether or not someone's good in a job. And so I'll talk about a couple of those in a moment. So, um, so outcomes as turnover. Um, in, this, is a, this is a box plot um, for, um, for observations in um, healthcare institutions. So um, PEGD is deployed into 119 healthcare facilities, by which I mean hospitals and clinics and long-term care facilities. Um, and each of those, it collects turnover data on, um, on every department and every job category. And, um, and so this year it'll collect three million job applications and you know, all the data 
that you can imagine would be collected on those job applications, so thousands of data elements on each person. Um, and these are the pre-post outcomes for all the observations in, um, in that deployment. So, you know, so you're talking about sort of thousands of different pre-post comparisons, because you've got the facilities, but then each side each facility, you've got all the departments and all the job categories. And so, um, for those, I would guess most people here are familiar with this way of visualizing this data, but for anyone who isn't, this is, um, this is sort of the full spectrum of sort of pre-post comparisons. So, um, so you know, what is, the, what is the reduction of turnover from before you deploy a, an approach like this to after you, approach, you deploy an approach like this? Um, and the box itself is the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, the means 37%. Um, the 75% is the 75th percentile. The, the, the smallest reduction in turnover was the 13.75 and the greatest was 100% reduction in turnover. So, um, so as you can see, this is significant. I mean, this is really significant. Um, you know, when you talk about turnover reductions of this kind of magnitude, you're talking about a lot. Um, but there's a couple problems with this. Um, problem number one is, is turnover actually the right thing to be measuring? So it kind of depends on where you are. You know, do you actually care if your turnover goes up or down? If you're a call center, you may not. Um, if you're a software engineering operation, you may. Um, if you're a hospital, you do when it comes to nursing, but you may care less about housekeepers. Or, or it may be that you think that you actually don't have a good staff to start with, and you want to increase turnover so that you can actually get the right people into the right seats. Um, so there's a, the other challenge with this is that often when, people, when enterprises are taking these approaches, um, they're doing something else at the same time. So it's not like they're saying, okay, we're gonna deploy data to figure out whether or not someone's gonna be good in a job, um, but we're not gonna make any other changes in what we do. And so, um, so you can say, you know, out of thousands of observations, every single one of them reduce turnover. But, but that's not necessarily a cause. I mean, it might be a cause, but it's not necessarily a cause. And so, um, so when we look at it, we also compare to a control group. And so in a hospital, a control group could be one of a couple of things. It could be, um, if you're deploying into a subset of job categories, it could be comparing to all the other job categories in the same hospital. Or if the, if the deployment is into a hospital system, you could compare the job categories where you're deployed in one hospital to the, job, the exact same job categories in other hospitals inside the same system. Again, so that you try to capture the problems with the time series issue, um, and you try to triangulate it on cause. And I think this is important, frankly, for looking yourself in the mirror, that you're actually doing something good, um, but also when you are trying to drive adoption, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, making sure that you're being methodologically pure in this is important. And so this is a comparison of, um, of where that platform is deployed to the control group. Again, it might be the same job categories in the same job categories in other hospitals in the same system, or um, or different job categories in the same hospital. And um, and the denominator in this is um, is sort of the pre-existing conditions. So if if turnover was 10% before in the, in the sorry not the pre-existing the control group. So if the, um, the control group turnover is 10%, this is how much less was turnover um, than than the control group. So um, again, very significant results. Um, but the question is, as I said before, what happens if turnover isn't the right? isn't the right metric. And you know, if you're optimizing for turnover, that's one thing, but what if you want to optimize for a different result? In a hospital, it's a little easier, frankly, um, because you can use um, certain hospital outcomes. So um, hospitals are moving towards being reimbursed for um, patient experience results, and those are called HCAP scores. And um, so, so one way to do it is to optimize for HCAP scores. And so the way that, that this platform does it is to take the outcome, the the patient experience scores, the HCAP scores as the outcome, and then to use um, time and attendance data um, and EMR data, electronic medical record data, plus all of the individual data in order to triangulate in on who touched which patient. And that's what allows you to optimize for, um, for the outcome of patient experience. Um, you know, this is a relatively early thing for PEGD, um, and so, uh, so I only have pre-post. Um, so these are just percentiles, but you know, I think from the sort of early data, we see sort of meaningful results, but, you know, but I think time will tell on it. Um, inside software engineering, there are some, there are some other um, interesting outcomes. So um, this, this is data from a um, Fortune 500 sports apparel company that um, 
creates a prominent piece of wearable technology um, that also has a bunch of digital products and a game for the Xbox Connect and a platform that ties it all together um, and has used a variety of different ways of sourcing software engineers um, to execute that work. One way has been um, by sending network offshore, another way is by sort of conventionally outsourcing it domestically, and a third way has been by using um, services that are deployed through a platform that applies data to hiring software engineers. And um, the results are, are pretty striking. Um, the data on the left, which is, um, which is frankly a little bit hard to see, is um, average cards per month all the way to the left, median cards per month um, second, Average points, so in software development, as I think most people know, you, one way of measuring a unit of work when you have combined, in a comparable when you have combined teams, is story points. And so it's a way of defining a unit of work, um, and then median points per month. You know, even when sort of everything else was controlled for, there were pretty meaningful differences on the order of 77% uh, more, um, more cards done per month uh, using the data deployed model um, compared to a non-data deployed model um, and you know, very significant differences in defect rates. And again, these are outcomes that you can use to, you know, as, the, as the predictor in the models. Um, they also found significant cost improvements by using a model like this, and there are a couple reasons for that, but, you know, but they've basically found a third of the, a third of the cost per story point um, by using a, by using a, a model of, of uh, services that were based on a platform like this. And um, the reason for that was, um, and we find this in some of the other approaches, is by recognizing what's telling you something and what isn't and whether or not someone's gonna be good in a job, you can do a lot um, in terms of broadening your pool of people you're drawing from. So, um, so when you find that, that there's no statistically significant correlation between a college degree and success as a software engineer, it brought massively increases the pool of software engineers you can draw from, and also by drawing on, on areas of the workforce that have less demand in them, you can get better people. And so that drives, uh, drives significant economics. Um, Evolve On Demand is another platform that's used for this. Um, Evolve um, you know, has been pretty prominent in the space, particularly as it focuses on call centers. It's, uh, um, and it sort of has been deployed in a bunch of different call centers. And interestingly, similar to the software engineering space, Evolve found that there was almost no correlation between relevant prior experience and success in a call center. And that can be defined in a whole bunch of different ways. It can be defined in terms of turnover, it can be defined in terms of number of calls taken, call resolutions. Um, but by finding that, it massively increased the pool of people that the call centers could draw on. Um, similarly, they found um, pre-post data, which is the only stuff they've released publicly, um, but pre-post data that was pretty significant um, in terms of reduction in turnover in call centers by deploying these kinds of models. 20% um, at Xerox, which used to, the division that used to be um, ACS, Affiliated Computer Services, um, and Novo One, which is a big call center company as a client of Evolves, found a 39% reduction in turnover. So again, very significant stuff. Um, adoption. So, you know, everyone here is dealing with this in some way. Um, you know, how do you figure out, um, how do you figure out, you know, sort of how to get, persuade people this is the right thing to do? And, um, and so one of the challenges is HR. So um, there are early adopters in HR, and there are non-early adopters in HR. And, you know, sort of the daily life of HR and executive is tough. Um, and, and their budget isn't tied to the P&L typically. And so, um, so figuring out how HR can engage this. Um, often HR folks don't have a data background, and so that's challenging. A re the regulatory environment um, is, you know, is tough um, because people are afraid that there's gonna be disparate impact. Interestingly, we found that actually it reduces disparate impact, um, which you'd expect by sucking bias out of the system, that, um, that when you compare applicant pools to hires, that, that there's, a, there's a comparison that essentially, you know, that it, it's a cleaner comparison, that there's less bias when you apply these models. Um, and individual resistance. So you think about sort of the online dating industry. Um, you know, it's, this is personal. This is very personal. And there was a lot of resistance for a long time before it really took off. And I think that we'll see similar, you know, a similar resistance in this space. Um, but I think it's sort of starting to be chipped away by everything that everyone in this room is doing. Um, again, outcomes drive the adoption. That's really the key, that by showing outcomes um, that you can drive adoption. That's all I got. So thank you very much. Thanks.